tell me at the beginning when you first got this script, how did it come to you and what was what was the first uh, response you had to it? So the script came by via uh, this mutual uh, agent uh, named Christina Chow that we, Isaac and I share. And uh, it was like late 2018. And she said, uh, I represent your cousin. And I was like, who's my cousin? Um, and she was like, Isaac Chung. And I was like, what? It was so strange because I didn't, I didn't really talk to Isaac. Um, he's my wife's cousin. And um, and I had seen his first film, Lin Yang Rangabo, the first year it was out in theaters when I met my wife. And then for it to come full circle like that, to have this kismet moment where um, Christina was telling me that there was a script that he wrote that we'd like you to see. I was like, well, this is so wild. And so I, I read it and um, it was so honest. Um, it was so truthful and it was so confident in its own point of view that I really loved it. I, I loved it most that it was unwavering in its own self, that it didn't require um, a juxtaposition to anything else but its own existence. And that is something that I'd been looking for for a while because, you know, I think if, personally for me as an Asian American actor, I think we have a lot of scripts like this that want to explore um, our stories and I think sometimes we get mired too much in larger, servicing larger expectations of an audience or a gaze or um, trying to find a way to piece together an identity. But this one was just like, no, this is a story about this family and we don't have to explain anything. What were some of the other scripts that were coming your way? I mean, you have this remarkable career where you began with this seven year run on Walking Dead. Was it really just five months after you got to LA and started auditioning yeah. that you landed that role? Yeah, don't talk to me. No, I'm just kidding, I'm already talking to you, it's terrible. <laughs> I think everybody knows, yeah. I, think, I think everybody knows. But, but you had, you were able to leave with a, the confidence that comes with being a star, a, a established, a name, a brand, if you like, I hate to use that word. Um, but it, I find it really interesting that you chose to uh, take off and, and do art films after that. Um, what was being presented to you that made you make, make that choice? <laughs> You know, this could, we can get deep into this one. I think for me, I simultaneously held and, and kind of pushed away a feeling of knowing that I was one of few Asian American faces on uh, TV and cinema at the time, especially. Um, there were John Cho, Sandra Oh, and Daniel Lee Kim, and, and wonderful people that navigated an even diff more difficult time than myself. But, um, you know, I, I was kind of being able to, I, I was being asked to occupy a space that was also kind of fresh and new in that it was, the character wasn't too stereotypical or needed to be defined by their ethnicity. Glenn That's was kind true. of, yeah, he was kind of, beyond that conversation. And what's tough about that, what's, what's great about that was that it was an incredible liberation for me because that's kind of the place that we always want to get to. You know, on a societal context, I think the context hadn't been really laid out to give a backstory to someone like Glenn, um, to understand where he might've come from and have like, at least like a larger societal understanding of like, who an, a Korean American kid like him could be and was from. And because I was aware of those things, um, when the opportunity presented itself of, you know, a natural end to the role, um, I had, you know, the, the, I had been afforded so many things. I had been afforded seven years of repetition of, of, of the craft of acting at that speed. Uh, I've been afforded understanding what it's like to be like the biggest show on, in, in television at the time. 
Uh, we did things at Madison Square Garden. There was just like crazy things that I experienced that afterwards what I realized I deeply gained was a lot of knowledge, but most importantly, like a massive privilege um, in not being a starving artist. And, and a Twitter um, following. Yeah, and a Twitter following. Yeah. How, like, how many? How uh, how many do you have now? Followers. Uh, um, I don't know. I, Twitter, I don't use as often. I think. Are you on Instagram, Instagram more? more? Yeah, Instagram. I think like the three million something. It's you know <laughs> crazy. Um, and that's all currency, right? Like that's 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 kind of what I mean about like I wasn't a starving artist. Anymore. No, no, you had what they call, um, we're on IndieWire, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Fuck you, money. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and so for me, I, I realized that I wanted to contextualize me. You know, I really wanted to understand how I might express myself um, in a deeper way. I think the things that presented itself to me at the time were just more extensions of the same um, it was more like, it, it was cool because it would have been precedent making. It was like things like, hey, you get to be the lead of this show, but you're like a scientist that created like a robot friend, or you're like a CIA operative that's on the run, but you're like the tech guy. And so it was always like, we'll get, let you free, but like, we'll still put you in the box that we can understand you. You were turning it, those things down? I was turning those things down. Um, and it was because I spent seven years doing it. <laughs> you know, I, I spent seven years ostensibly playing that person. And I don't know where that confidence came from. I actually don't think it was confidence. I really think it was more like, I just spent seven years immersed in a reality that wasn't mine. And I couldn't tell the difference between where I ended and where that began. And I didn't want to do that again. And so, um, I was just so fortunate that I got to work right out the gate with, with Pong Juno and he kind of started the journey of a self-reflection that was simultaneously personal and also like served to like contextualize maybe a larger narrative of what someone like myself that looks like me could come from. And then like each thing kind of built on to the next and Again, so lucky that I get to work with Boots Riley, that I get to work with Yi Chang Dong, that I get to do then Binari with Isaac. Like, it's not purposeful. I just feel very fortunate that these are the things that are available to be made at the time that I'm available. Um, I love it that you're willing to play darker. Uh, I mean, one of the great things about what you did in Burning and also in, in this movie is you're willing to go with sort of darker shades of, of, of a character who might not be doing things that are entirely likable. Mm -hmm. uh, the father goes into, uh, he's very headstrong and stubborn. And, and I'm talking about Minari now. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, care what his wife wants. Yeah. He just wants her to, you know, do, do his thing and let yeah. him be the patriarch, which, yes. which is, I thought, very brave of you. I, I wondered how you felt about that. 당신 행복할 때 제일 예뻐 보이더라. 음. I think I think it's my natural attraction to my own humanity. Um I have real no desire to uphold or be seen um, in a way that's a holier than thou or an untouchable context. I think for me, like, it's more powerful to feel human. Um, and that's kind of where I'm operating from. Um, if I go too deep into it, it sounds super pretentious, but um, it's, it's existential at some point. <laughs> Um, so you liked the script and, and you, 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 you came on as executive producer. What, what was that about? Um, that was, you know, <clears throat> something that I deeply wanted to do. I realized that in the journey that I made so far, that the only power I had was in helping create and, and, and service and uphold stories that were in, like, that felt true to me or something that I deeply related to. And so, um, I think I learned early on that in order to find the freedom that I wanted creatively, 
I had to forge my own way. And so in this particular circumstance, I, I realized that um, I could be a part of, I had built enough cachet at this point to be a serviceable commodity to green light something like this that perhaps wouldn't have the same chance. And so I jumped at the opportunity to not only help green light it, but also um, I felt like I also wanted to be a voice that could you know, maintain its integrity throughout the process. So were you part of the uh, pathway to plan B and, yes. and, and A24 and everything? Yeah. 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 yeah that's really cool. Cause, cause they help. They, they know oh, how to massive. develop. Massive. Yeah. 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 Christina yeah. Poe at plan B is a really good friend of mine. I met her on Okja and I sent her the script and I was like, you got to read this. And um, you know, it's been really beautiful since. So when you uh, get on the set and you're working with the other cast members, um, was 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 Yoon? Uh, uh, I'm using her last name. D did you did you find her intimidating a little bit? Um, no. What was she I mean, like? She's so incredible. Um, I think the highest respect I can give someone is to call them real, and they're very. Re she's very real. She tells it like it is. And she lives it honestly, and um, she's brave that way. And um, I know the lore of her has always kind of been that, that um, she's always just, she's, she's kind of just forced her own path and like dealt with the lumps and the heartaches and simultaneously also like the ups. And I think, you know, she's badass that way. And so um, it wasn't a fear, I think for me, um, what was really cool that I drew upon the relationship between YJ and myself to then mirror to Sunja and Jacob was just like, you know, Jacob, Jacob doesn't kind of want Sunja there because Sunja is the only one of the people that can actually probably really see him for what he is and see right through him. And in that same way <laughs> as me, the actor, I also knew that YJ could see right through me if I gave a false performance. And so um, that pressure was nice to have. And so it wasn't that I was scared, scared or fearful of her. It was more like I, you know, I wanted her validation. I wanted to, her to think that, you know, also I was doing a good job. And um, that was a cool tension to play with. That's actually, yeah, I can see that. Well, the other thing that moved me so much about your character, um, and you do, you do draw us in and, and you make us care about him, which is of course everything, but he, he seems so lonely and isolated from his own family. And he's just soldiering on in this very um, intense way. Um, and I couldn't help wondering uh, if your own father played a part in how you played mm. Jacob. Perhaps to some degree, um, my dad wasn't as brooding as Jacob is, or maybe even I am. <laughs> <But> <laughs> my dad is a pretty genial natured person. But I will say, you know, that drive to uproot your family, uh, especially when my dad had a really stable job as an architect and he owned a home in Seoul. Um, it's not like we were doing bad. He, he, he made a decision to uproot his family to get land. And um, that's such a bold move and such a bold choice. And I often thought about what compelled him to do that. And, you know, when I ask him about it, he doesn't even know himself or remember, he just knows it was a feeling. And, you know, as an extension of my own father, as, as the son of my father, I think I, I also resonate with that feeling of just like wanting to make my own life and um, wanting to find who I am and what my purpose is and what I'm here to do. And um, like I said, that existential, isolated loneliness that comes with that feeling is uh, I love it I mean it's terrible sometimes but I also like am deeply attracted to it and um, interesting yeah I think that's Jacob to me um and that's James Dean to me that's so many people that have just lived in the gaps uh and thrived in the gaps and um I like that well, part of what this movie about is about is the is the immigration experience, and you've 
you've gone through it yourself. And I mm -hmm. um, tell me what it was like uh, in terms of what was um, what was being said in Korean and what was being said in English and what that set was like in terms of the language and the culture on, on the mm. set, especially being shot in Arkansas, which is- Yeah, right yeah. Now. That wasn't necessarily difficult. Um, I was lucky that I had been able to navigate that many times before with Bernie and with Okja, especially. Um, Okja was painful because I had to acknowledge that I was kind of like that character, just caught between two worlds, and unable to service either one and looking stupid at all circumstances um, because he was desperately seeking validation. Um, and then burning to play someone so isolated in that way through the top was really eye-opening too. And so um, I understand the liminal space that I think an immigrant like myself inhabits. And I think, you know, when we were merging two places like Korea and America in its production, this production, playing the conduit between both places can be difficult. Um, it can be painful because in some ways I'm, my perspective, this, that perspective is the one that can see how people are misunderstanding each other. And yet, um, you know, it's hard to explain to each other, to them, how they're misunderstanding each other. And sometimes you have to bear the brunt of, of, of the anger, uh, if there is any. And luckily there wasn't anything like that on our set, but it was just um, the care to make sure that both sides were um, able to, to, to meet at a human place. And um, I think Isaac definitely created a, an environment and an atmosphere that allowed people in um, I think people's initial hesitations were totally warranted and like make total sense that people, American side probably wants to give a lot of deference to a story like this. And the Korean side wants to be, you know, to be validated that this thing matters. And so um, it, it was, it was just kind of, yeah, it, it was, it was the very, it's so Korean American what it felt like. <laughs> <laughs> a good yeah. answer. Good yeah. answer. Back to back to square one. But but the idea the idea is also I, I am fascinated by the idea of all these different audience pockets that exist mm. out there, mm. you know. And you you had that mainstream television audience, but then there's also the Korean American audience, and there's the Korean audience, mm -hmm. and then there's the art house audience, and mm. they're all different. And mm. um, and I wondered how um how the, how do you think about that? I haven't contextualized it like that. I didn't even think I had that many audiences, but now that you bring it up, that might exist and that makes sense. But I think, I think like I said, I'm, I know in America, the construction of identity um, oftentimes gets labeled and delineated in a lot of different ways. And certainly in the last couple of years, I think um, for all the wonderful things of expanding our culture has happened. We've also inadvertently created a lot of, a lot more boxes. Mm -hmm. And um, there's good and bad to both things. And for me, I wanna just acknowledge all of it. I, 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 we're all of it, you know, we're, we're so flat. We're, we're, we're high and low and left and right. It's just all the same thing at some point. And there's something deeply human about that. And I, and I feel a really strong affinity towards exploring that space where we can all meet. And I don't know what that is or how that manifests, but- um, Minari is an example of it because it's in the middle. It's not mm -hmm. all art house and it's not all it's it, it is in a, in a, and I think this is what the SAG uh, ensemble nomination actually represents. It it is mm -hmm. mainstream, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's artistic and it's great, but it's also accessible yeah. to to a large group of people, and it's very moving. It's not you. you know Thank a you. dry arid exercise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you that. and you yeah no you're totally part of that. So so when the Golden Globes uh, has these rules that mm -hmm. Minari has to be considered uh, a foreign language film, how do you feel about that? Our California town is not there. No one was there. Right.
Well, you know, I, I, I get, I get the anger. I get um, the, I get the response to this. I also understand. Um, I also understand how institutions and rules like fail us all the time. You know, I, I, I know that they're never able to capture the complexity and nuance of real life. And in this particular instance, like there, that, that rule exists. And I think you can follow it to the letter of the law. But the truth is, is that the feeling that's emanating from a moment like this and from this film is that like an Asian American experience oftentimes carries with it um, an un-Americanness or an outside right. perspective and uh, never kind of encapsulated as part of Americana. And so whether the rule is sound or not, um, that's the feeling that's coming from it. And so I'm kind of really proud to be part of uh, a project that kind of shot an arrow directly at the bullseye of what this feeling is. And it's challenging these rules and institutions that often fail us uh, because how can they know until we tell them? And this thing is telling them like what they might be missing. And I'm also then proud of the vocal voices that are the voices that are calling it out for what they feel and what this means to them. And I don't know if that'll change anything. I hope it does, but it feels right and cool that um, this thing gets to be that. Absolutely. So, so this broke out really big at Sundance 2020 and it got the jury prize, the yeah. dramatic grand jury prize. It got the audience prize, which is rare that you get both. Mm -hmm. And then um, COVID came. Came yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so it was. I think I think it was going to be a summer release or something. And so so what what was that navigating like? I mean, were you really worried uh, that, that that the movie would get lost or? You know, this film, in and of itself, um, feels like it's just creating its own terms. Um, it felt like Isaac, and I don't want to get too intangible with it in some way <laughs> like uh Isaac wrote something and he wrote something that I feel attracted very specific people to it and and when we were making it the things that would happen on set the the people that would come to it that we would find really amazed me and was it was it was so special and like the moments that we would catch that weren't scripted um the the single takes that we had like the, the 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 kind of the difficulties we had to manage that ended up creating like incredible better opportunities um i only count it as like part of the journey of this thing and so um i'm not saying this movie brought on the pandemic please don't please don't think that but i'm saying, You're saying uh, it had a life of its own yeah and it continues to do so i think it navigates something there's something about the backdrop of this pandemic and the tragedy and the isolation and the sadness that is so pervasive of this time that I think Minari reflects or is made more poignant by. Um, and, you know, when it was first happening, Sure, I did worry. I was like, oh man, like we're not going to be able to do the fun things that we thought we were going to be able to do. It was a film festival and like hang around and like, but you know, the lessons that I've learned from getting a lot of these things taken away was the same lessons that I think Jacob learns in Minari, just like what's really important and who are you sharing this experience with? And um, maybe it's a reflection on a larger end of like what we're all going through too. So I don't know. I mean, these are my justifications as I've tried to justify the pandemic life to myself with two young kids. Um, but uh, I think it'd be foolish not to take some of these lessons with it. So that's kind of where I stand about it. Like it's, I don't even know if that many people would have been able to see this film or will see this film if it wasn't this situation. Who knows what, things or news would have buried this film if it was just out in the open in a normal environment. I don't know. But uh, luckily, uh, A24 uh, has has somehow <laughs> figured out how to navigate yeah. this. Um, so let me ask you about The Humans, which is your next, right? Um, that's yeah. been delayed as well. Um, but I think, yes. um, 
so yeah. what's going on? Tell me a little. I saw that on Broadway, I, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. great. That's yeah, yeah. Pleasure. I was so lucky to be a part of that cast, too. I mean, it's Richard Jenkins, Jane Hottishow, Jim Squibb, Amy Schumer, Beanie. Uh, and, and then Stephen Karam is so special. Um, I, I, I've seen it, and there's nothing like this. Um, he made something new. And um, he's, an, he's an incredibly inspired, special writer and, and playwright, but even more, I think he's an incredibly special director. And so, um, yeah, this was another one of those immersive experiences where I'm surrounded by other artists that are like really down to game for this project. And that was cool. I don't know how I get so lucky to find these people, but like, it was another one of those, you know, you just leave, you're being like, hey, like, that was cool, right? And we still talk on a text chain, like, that was cool. <laughs> I wish we could just get this movie out there. But um, yeah, we'll see. When is, that, when is that coming? Do you know? I have no clue. I wish I did. Okay. I look forward to that. I look forward to what you do next. And thank you, uh, thank you for taking yeah. the time to talk to us. Thanks. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.